Good morning and welcome to Home Retreat. I'm Father John. Just to say, I wrote this talk several weeks ago after the COVID restrictions on keeping churches locked was being eased. And it's entitled Coming Back to Mass. It's well over a year since many people have been able to attend regularly a Sunday Mass in the flesh, so to speak. In the Abbey, we've been fortunate to have the technology to enable people to pray the Mass with us by live streaming. And that's been very popular and very much appreciated, despite some early teething problems. But imagine if the pandemic had happened a decade or so ago, what would we have done then? For many people, the absence from church has made them even more aware of the importance of the Eucharistic celebration in their life. And the prayer of spiritual communion that's often said at the end of a Mass has become a sort of poignant longing for the time when the gift of the body and blood of the Lord can actually be received sacramentally, really. I developed the habit when the lockdown started of logging into a Mass each Sunday to try to have that experience that so many people had of virtual Mass. Of course, in the community, we've been fortunate. Our celebration of Mass and the Divine Office have continued throughout the past year. In fact, restrictions on travelling has meant that more members of the community have been present at Mass and Office than would have been perhaps in the past. God, after all, can always find a silver lining in the darkest cloud. Watching Mass every Sunday was a very strange experience, watching it on a computer. At first it was hard not to treat it like watching a programme on iPlayer and having a cup of tea or doing little jobs at my desk. It was a real effort to focus on being at Mass, on really trying to make it a prayerful encounter with the Lord. I found I was spending more time preparing the readings beforehand to try and make the most of the celebration. Of course, it's never the same as actually being at Mass. And this short reflection, I simply want to look again at Mass, and I'm thinking particularly of Sunday Mass, and perhaps how to enter more deeply into the celebration, a sort of refresher. So I'm not saying anything new, really. I think all of us benefit from looking again and again at what we do so regularly, and perhaps take for granted, to stop it merely becoming repetition. Soon, the restrictions on public worship will be lifted completely, please God. We'll be able to celebrate properly as communities in whatever part of the country we live. We'll be able to enter more and more fully into that mystery of Christ's love, his sacrifice on Calvary, which is the Eucharist. So we need to be ready for coming back to Mass. So first of all, we need to prepare for Mass. Some while ago I became aware that I wasn't really preparing before Mass. I'd arrive on time and put on the vestments, perhaps chatting with people in the sacristy, and then began. I felt I needed time to slow down, to recall what I was about to do, who I was about to encounter. I discovered the prayers that the priests used to say before putting on each individual vestment, and I started to use them, partly as a way to slow down and take time, but also to leave behind my busyness and get ready to enter a sacred space. So I'd encourage you to try and arrive perhaps a little more at Mass than you would normally do to make your preparation. I know one priest who always takes off his watch before he celebrates Mass to remind him that he's about to enter the heavenly liturgy of which our Mass is a foretaste Christ is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lord of all time. And at Mass we're about to enter that timeless mystery. I know it's not always easy to arrive early, especially if you have other commitments or you're trying to get children ready. But even the ritual of leaving home, entering the church building, blessing with holy water when we're allowed to, all these things help to prepare our mind and our heart for a special encounter, for something special, something sacred. And there's always 
Also what we might call remote preparation. The Eucharistic fast of one hour before Holy Communion. In one sense, an hour is just a token gesture, really, not a hardship. It probably just means not eating on the way to Mass. But it's still a conscious reminder that we're about to do something special. It's not simple food. It's the body and the blood of the Lord that we receive for our journey through life. Then the Mass starts. The priest enters the sanctuary. We all stand. And we see him kiss the altar. First, because the altar represents the body of Jesus, the body which he sacrificed for us, with the altar cloths around it, rather like the cloths wrapped around the Lord's body in the tomb. Also because the altar table often contains the relic of a saint. And that reminds us of the early Christians who celebrated their Eucharist on the tombs of the martyrs in the catacombs to honour their memory, since they shed their blood just as Christ did, out of love for us. As we read in the book of the Apocalypse, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. So right at the start, we remember that Christ is the altar, the priest and the lamb of sacrifice. It's his sacrifice that we share, that we celebrate together. In traditional altars, the priest would mount three steps up to the altar, representing the persons of the Trinity, and also the virtues of faith, hope and charity, symbolising the ascent to Mount Calvary. And he would look at the figure of the cross over the altar, just like the one that hangs beneath the arch here at Ampleforth. At the start of the celebration, then, we confess our sins. I always tell the children that Christ died for our sins, so let's offer them to him, that he might take them away. When we go to Mass, we're like the good thief who hung at Jesus' right side upon the cross. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what Jesus said back, this day you will be with me in paradise. If he can say that to a convicted criminal, he can say that to you and to me. I knew someone who once complained that she did not like being reminded that she was a sinner at the start of Mass. And yet, if we can't face ourselves honestly before God, we'll never be able to change or to move on, to move out of our selfish pride. We confess not to make God feel better, but so that we can be healed and grow and change. Then we turn to the great hymn of glory, glory to God in the highest the song that the angels sang at the Lord's birth in Bethlehem. Originally, it was only sung at Masses at Christmas, and then its use spread to Sundays and major feast days. Because it's a song of joy and praise, it's not said in Masses for the dead or during seasons of penitence, Advent and Lent. In the Gloria, we raise our minds and hearts to God. We join the angels in their everlasting praise of the Godhead in heaven. Some musical versions of the Gloria really evoke the mystery and the wonder of God. Now that we've talked to God, confessed our sins and given him praise, then God speaks to us in the liturgy of the word. The Father speaks to us through the prophets and the other inspired works of the Bible in the Old and New Testament readings. The Son speaks to us through the words and events of his life in the Gospel. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through the teachings of the Church, through the words of the priest in the homily. And we stand to listen to the Gospel as we might stand when an important person enters the room, because Jesus really is present to us in his word, in the reading of the Gospel. We make a sign of a cross on our forehead that we might listen and reflect on the gospel. We make our cross a cross on our lips, that we might speak the gospel and a cross on our heart, that we might ponder it in, its, in our deepest being. Just as Mary did when the angel spoke the words of the Annunciation to her, she pondered all these things in her heart. And again, if you can do a bit of preparation, the liturgy of the word will sink deeper into your heart 
Many people have a Sunday Missal with the readings in, though you can get the readings on the internet. And one good resource, a bit of advertising here, one good resource is Father Henry's Wednesday Word. It's a reflection every Wednesday on the following Sunday's Gospel to, to inspire Lectio Divina. Again, that can be downloaded easily from the internet. After the Creed, and that would need to talk all of its own and the bidding prayers, the offertory begins the second main part of the Mass, the Liturgy of the Eucharist. At the beginning, the priest offers the bread, the white host of unleavened bread. Just like the bread Jesus himself used at the Last Supper in the ritual Passover meal he shared with his disciples the night before he died. During the offertory, it's important that we offer ourselves to God, lifting our hearts to him with the host on the pattern. The bread symbolises all of us who will be united with Christ at the Mass, just as the many grains of wheat are united in baking a loaf of bread. Bread is also a symbol of Christ. He did say, I am the bread of life. Bread nourishes our body, gives us strength. Christ in the Eucharist nourishes our spiritual life. And then the host is placed on the square of linen called a corporal, from a Latin word meaning body, as it will soon become the body of Christ. The priest then adds wine to the chalice with a tiny drop of water. The wine standing for the divinity of Christ. It will soon become, in reality, Christ's blood. And the tiny drop of water stands for you and me, becoming fully united into Christ. May we share in the divinity of Christ as he humbled himself to share our humanity. I think that's one of my favourite prayers in the Mass. Just as the wine and the water are mingled in the chalice and can no longer be separated by joining our sacrifice to the one on the altar, we hope to become one with Christ through the Eucharist. When God the Father receives the offering of his Son in the Mass, he receives us too. He forgives us our sins, our weaknesses and our faults because he loves the Son so much and we are with the Son. After those prayers of offertory, the priest prays to God to purify him. Wash me, Lord, from my iniquities. Cleanse me from my sins. He prays for humility and contrition which are necessary for all of us to purify us from our sins. He asks God to bless our offering so that we too, it too will be purified. And he washes his hands as a sign of purity. And during these prayers, although you may not hear them, they may be said silently, perhaps all of us should ask God to cleanse us of everything that would take us away from Christ. And the priest asks the people to join him in offering the sacrifice to God. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father. Each of us joins our own personal sacrifices in this life with Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. Take up your cross and follow me, he had said. Then the great prayer of thanksgiving the Eucharistic prayer begins with its preface, followed by the Sanctus. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. The words heard by the prophet Isaiah and St. John in their visions of heaven. In the dialogue, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. They believe to have been instituted by the apostles themselves. They signify we're entering the Holy of Holies in Mass. There are four main Eucharistic prayers, each one slightly different. Here I'm referring really to the first prayer, the Roman Canon. You notice the priest makes a sign of the cross over the gifts at a certain point, asking God to accept the gifts to be offered. Then he begins a series of remembrance prayers or commemorations, some before and some after the consecration. The first remembrance prayer calls to mind the church and all its members, all gathered at that celebration. And in the second remembrance or commemoration, we recall all those we wish to pray for at Mass. So don't forget to pray for all your special intentions. 
And in the third prayer, we remember the glorified saints in heaven, mentioning some by name, Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. Benedict, and so on. At this point, the priest lays his hands over the bread and the wine. Be pleased, O Lord. Be pleased, we pray, to bless and approve this offering. That gesture recalls the action of the high priest in the temple, laying his hand over the sin offerings, asking that God might accept the blood of the animal victim in place of the blood of sinners. And for us, that victim is Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes our sins away. Then comes in the centre of the prayer the consecration, using the words that Jesus used at the Last Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. And those words effect a change in the substance of the bread and wine, although to our senses they appear to remain the same. Faith tells us they're now the body and blood of the Lord. So for that reason, the priest genuflects in adoration. Many at that point repeat the words of St. Thomas, my Lord and my God. For Jesus said, my body is real food, my blood is real drink. These words of Jesus, the old covenant is fulfilled in the new. This is the blood of the new covenant the priest says. Sometimes people ask why there's a double consecration of the bread and then the wine. One explanation is it represents sacramentally the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the bloody sacrifice on Calvary when the blood was separated from the body of Christ as it were, in a physical way. The Lord shed his blood for us on the cross. In the Mass, the sacrifice is completed by the blood being separated from the body in a sacramental way, because the Lord is glorified in heaven, his body and blood are no longer separated. And in the Blessed Sacrament, he is as he is in heaven, glorious and alive. So Christ is present entirely, body, blood, soul and divinity, under the form of both bread and wine. So it's enough to receive Christ under one form, or one species. If we receive Holy Communion under the form of bread, as all have had to do during this time of pandemic, we still receive the whole Christ. As the prayer, the Eucharistic prayer continues, we come to the fourth Remembrance Prayer. We pray for those in purgatory, those who've gone before us in the faith, that their sins may be forgiven them. Often the priest leaves a slight pause there so we can add people's names, we can pray for the people we love, or perhaps pray for those who have no one to pray for them. Then we pray for your servants who though sinners hope in your abundant mercies. We pray for ourselves gathered around the altar, asking that we may join the saints in heaven. And then there's another list of saints corresponding with that at the start of the prayer. The consecration is the high point of the Mass. And what follows mirrors the offertory part, which came before it, the prayers before communion, and then Holy Communion itself. And that starts with the prayer that Jesus gave his followers, the Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses. At the end of the Our Father then, we ask to be delivered from evil. We ask God to free us from past evils, our bad habits, our sins, from present evils, temptations, sickness and anxiety, and from future evils, our sins, injury and death. And we pray for peace, peace in our hearts, in our families and communities, and peace in our world. At this point, the priest breaks the host into two just as the Lord's body was broken on the cross. And we say, or we sing, Lamb of God, recalling those words of John the Baptist when he saw Jesus on the banks of the Jordan. Jesus is the Lamb of God who is slain for us. And the priest breaks off a tiny piece of the host and places it in the chalice so that the body of Christ under the form of bread and wine become mingled, become joined again reminding us that the Lord's body and blood were reunited 
on Easter Sunday when Christ rose from the dead, never to die anymore. At one time, in ancient times, it was common to reserve the particle broken from the host for the next day's mass. And these particles could be shared with other churches. The shared particles of hosts signified the unity of each and every celebration of mass in that one sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. When the priest holds the host above the altar, above the chalice or the pattern, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, all respond with a beautiful prayer first said by the pagan Roman soldier who showed great faith in Jesus. Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof. Only say the word and my soul will be healed. It's interesting, up until this point, all the prayers of the Mass have been addressed to God the Father or the Trinity. But now the priest addresses Christ himself, the sacrificial lamb who lies on the altar in front of us. The blood of the Passover lamb saved the Israelites from the angel of death, enabling them to escape slavery in Egypt. Now in the new covenant, the blood of the lamb, which is Christ, saves us from death, of sin, and gives us the grace which is food for our souls. Behold the Lamb of God. And finally comes the time for Holy Communion. To approach the Lord, ready to receive him. It can sometimes feel a bit rushed, but take time on the way back. Spend a few moments in thanksgiving, aware that like the first apostles at the Last Supper, you have received the Lord's body and blood. His flesh is real food, his blood is real drink. Try, if you can, to have a moment of thanksgiving. And in no time at all comes the final prayer and the blessing and dismissal. If you can, try to stay for a while with Jesus, Jesus in your heart, in your soul. Jesus comes to be with us as he did on that first Christmas day so long ago. In every way, Mass is, every Mass is like Christmas Day, as I often annoy the children by saying Happy Christmas in the middle of June. If you haven't yet been able to get to Mass, I hope you can soon when the restrictions are lifted, and that you can appreciate ever more the gift that Christ offers us if we're open to receive it, his very self. May that gift transform you and enable you to lead others to Christ. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen.